So, greetings everybody. This is Lazarus Moises. And uh, we are going to have a series of lectures based on the course Automatic Control Systems. Uh, it's a course that I teach on the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Western Macedonia in Kozani, in Greece. And uh, I'm going to have a series of talks that I'm going to present in a minimal way the things that I talk about in the class. Uh, obviously, the class is four hours long per week. Uh, I'm not going to discuss everything that I teach uh, in the class, uh, but I'm going to summarize and provide the short sum up of all the things that we discussed. Okay, so let's begin. Of course, in the previous video, we discussed about the best possible books on control theory. So let's now start with the basics, right, with a general introduction. Now, the course is called Automatic Control Systems. But actually, if I were to choose a more appropriate title, uh, this would be uh, analysis and design of control systems. And I'm saying this because a very big part of introduction to control is the analysis of systems. So practically, I would say it's 80% of the course is analysis. So the idea behind that is that we first uh, aim to develop tools for analyzing dynamical systems. And then, based on those tools, uh, we can apply them into creating uh, control designs for any possible system. Okay, And of course, another general and very big part of uh, control systems in general, not part of this course though, uh, is the estimation of systems and the identification of systems. And I'm going to discuss uh, about that a little bit later. Okay, So, I'm saying again and again, system control of system analysis of systems. Uh, so, okay, what the hell is a system, right? So let's begin. Well, basically, generally speaking, a system is a collection of bodies, masses of objects in general. And this collection, uh, you know, interacts with each other inside an environment. environment. Okay. Uh, usually this environment is subject to some inputs, some external inputs that either we provide, so we know the inputs, or we don't know them. They are somehow uncontrolled by us for example, disturbances, and in some cases we may need to estimate them as well. Okay, so this system that is subject to various inputs provides some sort of output, and ideally our goal is to control uh, the outcome of the system, so the output of the system. Okay, a very general definition, of course. And the systems all around us, uh, there are many different types of systems. We may have natural systems uh, that exist in nature, we may have artificial systems that are man-made, and we may have some more abstract systems that uh, even ourselves have difficulty in defining their components. Okay, so let's begin with the basics. Natural systems, okay, I can provide millions of examples here. We can start with the basic, the human body. Okay, so this is a system and actually a control system. Uh, it consists of several different subsystems like our nervous system, uh, our, you know, uh, heartbeats, our um, system for digesting food. So it has a lot of different subsystems and it performs a series uh, of tasks. Some we can control, some we cannot control, like talking, breathing, uh, walking, balancing. We don't really control our balancing. It happens without us understanding it. Digesting the food, we don't really control our digestion. Uh, but it just so happens and heart rate, etc. cetera, uh, several different, you know, uh, a collection of tasks that are performed uh, by our own body. Okay, so this is a natural system. Another uh, uh, part of our uh, body is the immune system. Okay, so every time we get uh, infected by a disease or a virus, our immune system automatically controls uh, how this virus, um, you know, works inside our system and it tries to suppress uh, the infection. Okay, so many different uh, other examples of uh, biological systems. I'm going to discuss about them uh, later. Of course, regarding artificial systems, again, many man-made systems are automatic control systems. For example, a washing machine, okay, a coffee maker machine. These are simple control systems. An oven controls the temperature. An air conditioner controls the temperature of the room. So all of these very, very simple uh, systems exist in all of our houses. And they are basically control systems that perform some very, very specific tasks. Okay. 
Driving is another form of a control system. An automatic pilot is another form of a control system. Uh, if you go to the industry, we may consider robotic arms and robotic manipulators. Again, these are control systems. Uh, another very classic system, it's available in all of your books, it's the inverted pendulum. It's a very common control problem because it can be used to model many different tasks. Uh, a classic spring mass damper system, which absorbs shocks, for example, in a car, when you are driving through a bumpy road, this is another example of control system. The purpose here is to absorb shocks that come from a bumpy uh, road as we are driving. Okay, so all of these are control systems, right? Uh, regarding biological systems, I mentioned a couple previously, uh, but apart from our own body, another, uh, for example, is a lake, a forest, so this is a very big biological system uh, in size, but still it works through feedback, which I'm going to discuss later, well, you know, but let's say in general by taking some inputs from the environment and trying to balance the population inside the lake or the forest, okay. Uh, the artificial pancreas, it's a very big problem in biological control. If you go to Google and uh, search for artificial pancreas, uh, basically it controls the amount of sugar in the blood, so the idea behind control through artificial pancreas is that you measure uh, the sugar levels in the blood, in the blood, I'm sorry, every so often, and you inject some soft, sort of chemical to balance out uh, the sugar concentration. Another example is predator prey systems. You may have heard of uh, lotka Porterra equations. These are very, very common. Uh, we have uh, two or maybe more different, uh, you know, populations that are balancing uh, out with each other and they are antagonistic. For example, you have a predator and we have a prey and uh, the control usually comes through harvesting, for example. Okay, so in lakes or in uh, the industry where we cultivate, for example, fish, uh, we try to control the harvesting so that we have the best possible uh, outcome in each year. Okay, so this is a classic example that we can model using control system analysis tools. Okay. And regarding, of course, more abstract models, we may have like very, very big models uh, that are physically big as well. For example, a nation's economy, much more abstract. We know that it has very uh, much more, you know, multiple different uh, counterparts and subsystems. So it's a very big problem and very big system. It's very hard to analyze uh, accurately. Another example is a supply chain. Uh, inside a factory, for example, or inside a company. And uh, in some situations, we may have like models that are very hard to obtain, uh, you know, some sort of description for them. You can only have some sort of inaccurate models about it. For example, when you are controlling uh, COVID growth in a society, okay, so when you are trying to model the pandemic and how it spreads in a society, again, there are models in the literature, but all of them are not very accurate. So you may have this sort of problem of trying to find out the most accurate model that can describe uh, the pandemic inside the society. So all of these topics are examples of systems and examples of uh, possible uh, problems that we may solve using control tools, right? This is an example, of course, of a very classic uh, spr spring mass damper system. If you open any of your books, you will find such examples inside. Of course, if you turn it uh, vertically, it automatically becomes a spring mass damper system for a car, for example. So here we have two masses, as you see in the right example. The first mass uh, models the wheel, and the second bigger mass models uh, the actual car. And you may be driving down a road, and you want to avoid, uh, you know, uh, hard oscillations. So this is a classic analysis that we may perform uh, for this system using control tools. Another example is very common in all of our houses, in uh, our bathrooms, uh, when we flush the toilet and the water begins rising up and it actually closes the valve that provides the water. Okay, super classic example uh, that is available in all of our houses, right? And here I have another collection of many different systems. So, for example, you may have uh, spring mass damper systems that are weird, not weirdly, let's say complex interconnected. Uh, this is the classic pendulum example, uh, very common in control systems. Uh, this is another example, the double pendulum. It's even more complex to control, and we'll see some examples that we control through linearization. 
This is a very simple robotic system. Uh, it uh, consists of two active wheels and the second and the third inactive wheel. So our goal here may be to strafe it and make it follow a desired trajectory. And again, this is a very simple example of a tank level system. Again, we can model it, especially in the linear case, using our analysis tools that we are going to describe throughout the course. Okay, so far too many examples <coughs> of systems, right? Another example here is a, a medical example. We have an HIV model. <clears throat> so we have three populations, a healthy CD4+, plus, the virus, and the infected CD4 plus cells. And through the infected CD4, we obtain more uh, increase in the viral load. So these three populations interact, and we can do the analysis <clears throat> using control analysis uh, tools. <clears throat> now, as you can understand, I gave you far too many examples. Uh, some of them are mechanical, some of them are economical, some of them are biological. Uh, so as you can understand, there is a plethora of possible examples that we can uh, study. Of course, one might think here, okay, Lazarus, I mean, I'm just a mechanical engineering student. I don't care about all of these, you know, or I'm an electrical engineer. So again, I don't care about all of these examples. Uh, well, okay, in this case, truth be told, uh, let me tell you that you never know uh, where your degree is going to get you. And, you know, five and ten years from now, what sort of job you will be doing. Uh, you may be all around uh, different jobs. So you can never know uh, which topic you are going to end up studying. And secondly, which is very important, you need to understand that although these systems are very different, different from each other, the underlying theory to study all of them and perform control technique and perform, I'm sorry, control techniques to all of them is the same. Okay, so the analysis tools are the same irregardless of the type of system. So this is very, very important. Now, uh, let's move on. We talked about what a system is. Let's talk about control, okay? What is control applied in a system, okay? So the idea in control is that we adapt the input of the system that we can uh, provide ourselves in order for the output to be desirable, okay? And by desirable output, of course, this has to do with the system at hand. We may be referring, if the system is mechanical, we may be referring to desirable speed for a moving object. Uh, let's say desirable position for UAV control, for example, or for example, a simple drone. Uh, we can be referring to temperature control when we are controlling an oven or an air conditioner inside the room. So our desirable output is a fixed temperature. Uh, we may be referring to a fixed level in case we are referring to a tank level control in the industry. So the idea is to provide the appropriate input so that the output is desirable. Okay. And in this case, it's not about uh, just achieving uh, the desirable output, so desirable speed or desirable temperature or something. It's also about achieving it in the best possible way. And for that, I mean, <clears throat> I'm sorry, achieving it in a relatively short time <clears throat> and also achieving it without having far too many oscillations. Okay, uh, imagine trying to reach 80 kilometers per hour in a car and you are not doing it properly. So you end up oscillating between 70 and 100 kilometers per hour, slowly, 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 until you stabilize on 80 kilometers per hour. So this is undesired. So controls refers to achieving the possible outcome that we want and also doing it in the correct way. Okay. And uh, in order to achieve that, we have what is basically the most fundamental um, principle in control systems. We have what's called the feedback. And uh, feedback is a super important principle and refers to performing a constant comparison between our current output that we somehow can measure, our desired output okay, that we want to reach. And of course, from this comparison, we obtain an error between actual and desired. And based on this error, we will adopt our input to the system. Okay, so imagine a system and continuously what we do is perform a comparison between actual output, desired output, and based on this error between them, we adapt our input and feed it back into the system. Okay, 
And this uh, principle is completely and, you know, I would say super fundamental in control systems. I would dare say you will not find almost any control system that works without feedback because it's super essential in achieving our goals. Okay. And uh, based on whether we have feedback or don't, uh, we have two big categories of systems. Okay. Open loop systems and closed loop systems. In open loop systems, we don't have feedback. So uh, this can only be done in situations where the system is super simplistic, where we have a controlled environment, where we don't expect any disturbances, and we can have, for example, some very basic uh, performance that when we can actually, you know, uh, pre-save in a controller and perform fixed, you know, in a fixed way every single time. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, Coffee machine. Okay. A coffee machine doesn't really require any basic feedback. Uh, of course, we have some feedback so that the system doesn't burn in case of uh, problems inside the house. But other than that, you click on the coffee maker, it heats up the water, it pours the water, it closes. Okay. Uh, it doesn't control whether we have water inside or not. Actually, if you open the coffee maker, if you even if you don't put water in it, it will still perform the same. Uh, job. Another example is a washing machine. Okay, it has a set of like ten predefined programs. You choose a program; it works the exact same way every time. Okay, so for example, if I am crazy and I want to put the machine working, the washing machine, without closing it, it doesn't have any feedback. The machine will not tell me that okay, you didn't uh, put any clothes uh, inside, or maybe you forgot to put the you know. Uh, uh, you know, the washing chemical uh, inside. It doesn't control any of that. This control uh, falls entirely on me as a user of the washing machine. So if I forget, for example, to put clothes in it, the washing machine will work exactly the same as, the same way as if it had clothes. Okay. So there is no feedback here. It performs some sort of predefined process without having any other feedback from the environment. So if the system is very simplistic, that's our best choice because such systems are easier to design. Uh, they are easier to, uh, you know, uh, perform. Uh, how can I say this? Uh, they, you know, they don't break up so often. Uh, so cleaning them up and uh, performing uh, some sort of, uh, how can I say this? Cleanup is much more easier to uh, do. And of course, they don't perform well for difficult tasks. Okay, so this is an option only for very, very simple systems. In any other situation, we may have to choose a feedback system. Okay, this is the system that you see down below. So from the output and the desired input, we have the error, and based on this error, we control our system, right? So for example, an oven. Okay, how do you open up an oven? You set the temperature to 200 degrees, and obviously, the oven inside has a uh, thermic uh, uh, part that controls the temperature and measures the temperature. So it knows that up until the point where we reach 200 degrees, it will continue working and heating up the oven. Once we reach 200 degrees, it stops working, right? So there is a feedback to control where we reach, at what point do we reach the desired temperature. But not only that, it can actually work well against disturbances. So if we open up the oven and the temperature drops from 200 to 180, it reopens and it starts reheating the oven. Okay, so you can see that in case where that we have a disturbance, it actually operates back and re-reaches the desired temperature. And the same holds for an air conditioner. Once it reaches 200, uh, not 200, sorry, 20 degrees Celsius, it stops working. But if we open up the door of our house, if we open up the window of our house and the temperature drops, the air conditioner understands that because it has feedback and begins working again. And it also it can reach the best temperature in the best possible way. So for example, if the room is very cold and we want to have it in 20 degrees Celsius, it will begin working very, very fast to reach and you know, uh, reduce the error very, very fast. And once it starts getting closer and closer and closer to 20 degrees, it will start working at a different speed and at a different intensity. So it has a variable input. Okay. 
And uh, this is one of the additional good things about uh, feedback, because in feedback, you can also obtain uh, a much more uh, energy uh, saving control in contrast to open loop. Okay, so of course, you can also have a system that works well under disturbances. And I would dare say, in general, you know, difficult tasks cannot be performed without feedback. Okay, imagine driving without feedback. Entirely not possible, right? If you want to drive a car, you need to have some feedback. Okay, so feedback systems are always the best choice uh, for all of these situations. Okay, you go for open loop systems only under very very specific conditions, right? So this is a very, very simple and sort of extreme example of control where we actually go from unstable to stable. So the open loop system here without feedback is unstable. It goes to infinity. Of course, in practical situations, by infinity, we simply need a very, very large value where the system way destroy itself. Okay. But after feedback, as you see right here, where we uh, compare the results, not only we go out, we you know we drop the instability and we make the system stable, but we also can control it in a you know relatively fast time and without many oscillations. So this is a very good example of pro feedback and without feedback uh, comparison. This is another uh, simple uh, example we do. Uh, linearized control on an inverted pendulum. And uh, you can see that we can actually stabilize the system and based on different control techniques, uh, here I perform optimal control, I may manage to reduce oscillations. So for example, you see here that the red technique is a bit better in reducing oscillations, okay? So this is the displacement of the cart, this is the velocity of the cart, and this is the displacement of the pendulum that is around here, the vertical position. And this is the uh, pendulum angular velocity. You see that we can actually manage to reduce oscillations uh, in the second uh, control case, because this is more of an advanced control, right? So as I already said, uh, feedback has many advantages that you can see right here. We optimize the energy, we adapt to disturbances, uh, we have stability, and we can fix uh, what we will later define as transient and steady state response. This basically means that we reach our goal and we reach it in a desired way. Okay, and uh, these are the basics of open and closed loop uh, feedback control, right? So, what type of problems uh, can we solve using control? Uh, many different types. Actually, there are all variations of the same thing. The most basic one is called the regulator problem. It's what I already uh, explained previously. The regulator problem means fixing the output to a desired point, okay? Just like the air conditioner or the oven. We want this desired temperature, so we start from zero and we want to reach this temperature. So reaching a fixed value is called a regulator problem, okay? A more difficult task is a tracking control. In a tracking control, we try to follow a trajectory. So for example, we don't wanna fix, you know, we don't wanna reach a desired temperature, but maybe the temperature varies as in a chemical process, and we need to follow this trajectory of a desired temperature. Or maybe we want to have a varying speed in a car, so we don't want to reach a fixed speed, but after we reach this fixed speed, we may have a varying speed that we need to follow. Okay. Or maybe there is a moving object in the horizon, and, one, and I want to have, have a camera that manages to accurately follow this moving object. Okay. These are the super basic uh, control problems. And of course, in some situations, we may not want to achieve those problems, but also we may have constraints. And this is a problem called optimal control. We may have, for example, time constraints. So I want to reach the desired speed, but in the smallest time possible. Or maybe I want to reach the desired speed, but I don't want to spend up too much fuel. So there is some sort of input constraint. We don't want to spend too much energy. Okay, so variations of the above under uh, constraints, right? But overall, whether we want to control the position of a body, the velocity of a body, the temperature in a room, the pressure in a room, uh, the level in a tank, or the pH in a tank in a chemical process, regardless of the problem, I would say that basically we want to achieve the same thing. Stability, so that we don't go to infinity, 
okay. Transient response, so we don't have oscillations, and steady state response, which means achieving our actual goal. Okay. So regardless of the problem, pretty much the goals are the same, you know, in several uh, small variations. So this is the classic, uh, as I said, regulator problem. Okay, this is an example from Norman, Norman Nies. So this is the desired input, and we want to reach this input without error. So ideally, if you want to have this goal, we don't want to reach this point. We want to reach this point exactly. Okay, so this is called the steady state error, which means after we stabilize, do we have an error or do we don't have an error, right? And secondly, is how we reach our uh, goal, you know. For example, should we have this sort of very, very smooth transition in uh, reaching our goal and with error or maybe without error? So ideally, we want to go like that. Uh, we want to go like that, you know. We don't want to have an error. We want to reach our goal uh, very nicely and very smoothly. Or maybe we can do it even faster, you know, and reach our goal earlier. And ideally, we want to avoid escalations. So we want to avoid going like that, you know, where we go up and down very fast. And we go something like this, which is a very big and undesired oscillation. Or maybe even even worse, you know, where we go and have very strong oscillations until we reach our goal. Okay. So generally, this is something that we want to avoid. This is the example that I drew right here. Okay, we have desired results somewhere in the middle uh, where we have this sort of uh, trade-off between reaching our goal very fast but not having too many oscillations. So somewhere in between is the best possible choice for us. Okay, again, this is an example of uh, the tracking problem. As you see right here, I don't have a stable input. Uh, I have some sort of varying desired goal. So let's say, for example, we want to go from here and here to here to here to here to here. So we oscillate between two desired positions. So our goal is to reach every position as fast as possible, as you see right here. So we start from zero. We obtain a command to move up. We move fast. And then we move to our second command, which tells us to go down again. So ideally, we would want to move fast into this position and then move back up and then move back down. And we want to do this as fast as possible and ideally without oscillations. So we don't want to go like that, you know, and not being able to follow the trajectory very nicely uh, because this means that we are unable to control the system uh, if it has varying inputs. So this is undesired. Ideally, we should follow the trajectory very, very uh, fastly and without many oscillations, okay? This is an example that may appear, uh, as you see right here, in the spring massing uh, system, for example, in a moving car, and you are driving down the road and you go through a bump. So what should happen? Ideally, you shouldn't have something like that, where the amplitude of this mass goes very high up and very high down and obtains a very undesired oscillation. Okay. If your car is very, very old, this is what will happen. But ideally, in a good car, in a good car, you may obtain something like that. Once you go over a bump, you go a little bit high, a little bit up, but then steadily and very fastly you move down into your original position. Good cars and new cars have this sort of behavior, while very very old cars that are very uh, uh, very drawn out will have the undesired behavior of having far too many oscillations. Okay. Now, as I said, let me also uh, make a note of this. Apart from analysis and control, a very, very big part of control theory is estimation. Okay, So estimation refers uh, to having some sort of system, having the output of the system, and you know we obtain some information through the output, but we don't obtain everything. Uh, this means, let's say, for example, you have a system with many masses that oscillates and you only obtain measurement from the last mass. But you want to estimate what happens for the other masses as well. Okay, so this is a very classic problem. It is uh, termed uh, system estimation, signal estimation. We do that, for example, using observers. And the idea is that by obtaining some measurements from the input, I will be able to estimate what happens internally in the system. So as you see right here, we have a system, we have the output of the system, that is this one, 
And I have a secondary system that manages to estimate what happens uh, inside here, okay? So as you see, this is an observer. And see, for example, in the first state, the red is the original and the black is the estimated. And you see that initially, we don't obtain a good estimation. Uh, the two trajectories are completely different. But at 70 seconds, I activate my estimation. So what happens? At 70 seconds, the black trajectory, which is the estimate, drops directly into the red trajectory. So we managed to accurately estimate the behavior of the system internally, and we do so by using this sort of measurement right here. And this happens for all the states of the system. So this is a classic problem that is called uh, signal estimation for estimating the internal states of the system, a very big part of the control community. And another big part, which is an even harder problem, is the problem of system identification. And uh, this is much more general. Uh, this tells us that we may have a collection of measurements. So we have a time series for a system, but the system in itself is like a black box. We don't know this system. And our goal here is to use this sort of measurements to uh, manage and estimate the actual model of the system. Okay. Uh, for example, let's say we have a mechanical system, we obtain some measurements, but the system itself is a black box. So we need to estimate what is the model describing this mechanical system. Or let's say we have a COVID happening inside the society. Uh, we have some measurements of the COVID uh, status through rapid tests, but we don't know the actual model that gives us the behavior of COVID. So what do we do? We use our measurements to try and create a model that will give us the behavior of COVID, for example, for the next 10 or 15 days. Okay, so this is uh, a very, very big problem in control system design. You can Google CINDY, sparse system identification, which is a very common technique used for uh, identifying system uh, through measurements, but it's not a part of the course, but it is a very, very big part of the control community. Now, I should always uh, mention, of course, control systems have been around since forever, I would say 2,000 years plus. Uh, there are many important cont contributors. Uh, if I would make some specific note, there are a couple of people that are the first ones to study system stability, like Herwitz, Ruth, and Maxwell, Clark Maxwell, actually, very well known. These are the first people that studied uh, stability in control systems. And I should also uh, mention some of the most important, I would say one of the most important people in control, uh, Rudolf Kalman. We could dare say it's, he's the father of modern control theory, uh, for which we should discuss later. Uh, he was one of the people that worked on the Apollo project, and he made the very famous, you can Google it, this actually, the famous Kalman filter, which is actually an algorithm for filtering out uh, noise pretty much relative to the one uh, to the problem of signal estimation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and he's also the father of uh, modern control, okay? Uh, very, very important figure. You can actually Google him and uh, learn more about him. Now, as a closing remark, the control community is huge. We have many societies, many communities, many journals, many conferences like QAS that works on unmanned systems. Uh, we have the IEEE community the SIAM community, the IFAC community, and many, many, many journals uh, that study different uh, problems in control. So the Society of Control Systems is very active at the moment, and we have many, many people from all over the world. Okay. So this is a short introduction to the course. We are going to discuss about some of these things in future lectures. So any questions that you have, uh, you write it. Uh, down below and I'm going to I'm going to reply to it. This is my literature. Most of them are in English, are in Greek though, but uh, some of them are in English as well. So any questions, write them down and I'll see you in a later video. Okay, thank you very much.